After answering numerous questions from you guys about trust, I figured why not get an expert on the show to come and unpack the entire trust system in South Africa for us. So today on the show, we're speaking to Nick Steed. He is the KZN Regional Director for Capital Legacy, and he's chatting to us about preserving our wealth with the means of trust. Welcome to the Wealth Nation Podcast, a podcast for every mother, daughter, grandmother, sister, and wife, and the men who are smart enough to tune in. The Wealth Nation Podcast brings you all you need to know about investments, business, property investments, personal finance, and all around financial wellness. Here is your host, Yolanda Rose. Thank you for joining me today in another episode of the Wealth Nation Podcast. I am Yolanda wealth coach and financial advisor. It is my goal to bring you all the content, strategies and tips that you need to manage your money well and build a generational wealth. Don't forget to join us on our social media platforms. Lots of exciting things are happening on all of the various platforms, different kinds of content uh, aimed at different kinds of audience. We are on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, are tons of uh, uh, Facebook groups, chat with different kind of, kinds of people, giving them different kinds of information. So link up with us on the various social media platforms that we're on. The Wealth Nation podcast is sponsored by Audible. Audible is a seller and producer of spoken audio entertainment, information and educational programming on the Internet. Audible sells digital audiobooks, radio and TV programs and audio versions of magazines and newspapers. For a 30-day free trial of Audible, go to www.audible.com financiallyfabulousfemales.com forward slash audible. So today on our financial terminology segment, we're speaking specifically about the Gini coefficient or the Gini index. So by definition, the Gini index is measured by the distribution of income across a population. And many economists and big financial organizations use the Gini index as a gauge of economic inactivity, measuring income dis- distribution within a population. So the coefficient ranges from zero to one, with zero representing perfect equality and one representing perfect inequality. And values over one are, are possible due to negative income or wealth. So in a country in which every resident has the same income, that country would have the Gini coefficient of zero. And in a country where one resident earn all of the income, while everybody else earn nothing, the the income Gini coefficient would be one. So how does this impact us uh, as South Africans? Well, South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world, and we all know about our harsh racial past, that being one of the most contributing factors. And in fact, in South Africa, the richest three and a half thousand people earn more than the bottom 32 million people. So that says a lot how how stark the livelihoods of South Africans are and how different the income income is spaced out. So South Africa's Gini coefficient is to date, I think by mid-2020, it was ranked at around 0.65. Gini coefficients of other emerging in- economies, India, Brazil, China, their Gini coefficients are sitting in the range of 0.35 to 0.55, whereas South Africa, we are sitting with a coefficient index of 0.65, which shows how the income is just skew in South Africa. In South Africa, the top 10% of South Africans earn up to 65% of all the income, and they also own 85.6% of all the wealth as well. But what is wealth in terms of the measurement of the Gini index? Well, wealth is a collection of all your assets from your land, your shares in companies, life insurance policies and pensions, everything that we talk about on the show. And it's often built up over time and is passed down over generations. Another thing that we talk about in the show. As a result, wealth reveals inherited economic privilege privileges in a way that income cannot. So in a country that's like South Africa, that has the past that we have, wealth inequality shows uh, how how our past is currently impacting uh, our future. So we can't really look at uh, the current Gini coefficient. We can't attribute it solely to the effects of apartheid. We need to look at the birth rate as well. And it's not something that most people correlate when it comes to um, the income gap or the 
the the gap in the income distribution in South Africa, if we look at the birth rate of those that are in extreme poverty, it's still very high. And that could easily be one of the contributing factors to the income disparity because really a pregnant woman can't really go out and work for the desired period of time. She also has the burden of of caring for a child. That's added child care costs and the cost of raising a child as well. So that could easily be one of the other contributing factors. And and actually, I was reading a, an article from the UN. I'm going to post that article in, in the show notes where you can read about um, fertility and the income disparity in, in South Africa and how it's skewed by, by income and by race as well. So... Not everything can be attributed to the past. Yes, we're living in a very volatile country that's uh, that's living the effects of the past. But we've been out of apartheid for the last 26 years. Things should have been getting better, but it's not. It's actually getting far worse when it comes to statistics and people are feeling it in everybody in their everyday lives. All right, so that's our finance terminology bit for today. So let's jump into that interview with, with Nick Steed. Now, we've spoken to Capital Legacy last year sometime around this time, and we spoke about wills and trusts and the value of that. And uh, Nick is here to tell us in a lot more detail and to answer some of the questions that you guys have posed to me in the last month or so when it comes to wills and trusts and how you should structure yourselves and the wealth preservation for your family. So, so let's jump into that interview with Nick. Remember, if you want to know more about this topic, I will definitely have Capital Legacy on again. Uh, I am an affiliate with Capital Legacy. And if you're looking uh, for any assistance from Capital Legacy or me regarding wills and trusts, go to www.financiallyfabulousfemales.com forward slash estate plan and get my guide that you can use to plan out your wills and your trusts and the pre- preservation of wealth in your family. Also, don't forget to join us for the How to Raise Money Savvy Kids Masterclass. The last one happens this Wednesday. So join us for that. It's www.financiallyfabulousfemales.com forward slash kids. Get on that masterclass and I'm going to share with you the strategies that I use to teach my kids about money. And I also want to let you know that Financial Education for Kids 101 is now open for enrollment. So if you want to know more about that, want to want me to face-to-face teach your kids about money, go to our website and find out more. Link out link up with us on social media and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that course as well. Enrollment closes this Friday. So now is the time to purchase your your ticket to entry, basically. So let's jump into that interview with Nick. Let's say John is a business owner and Jane is a teacher. They both married in COP and they have kids aged 8 to 11. The couple purchased a home for $2 million six years ago. There's an outstanding amount on the bond. Both Josh and Jane are actively saving for retirement with work pension plans and personal retirement annuities. Josh and Jane have their children as beneficiaries of their life covers uh, as, as they want their children to be taken care of when they die. So a lot of the questions I've been in, uh, getting is, what happens when my, one spouse dies, leaving the uh, family behind? So if you could talk us through that process and, uh, and tell us what happens. Like w- what happens when one, one spouse dies in terms from a financial point of view, what happens? What's, what's the process that's triggered? So, I mean, um, just looking at that scenario, um, the first thing I would, I would do is um, obviously look at the at structuring behind the scenario. So, for example, in this one, um, you've got two well-to-do uh, clients and then they've firstly left their life covers to their children. Yes. Now, in that... Um, you've got a bit of a, a wastage of tax benefit because because people are married, SARS actually is quite kind to um, to husbands and wives who leave things to each other okay. um, because they don't want to disrupt the situation. So the, the first advice or um, actually just rather, the first thing I'd want to actually establish with the clients, are they, are they happy to give up that benefit um, that they would get through leaving the, their life covers to each other? So, okay. if you if you look at um, the Estate Duty Act, there's a twenty percent tax that a client would need to pay on their estate when they pass away. 
Okay. They have 3.5 million rand rebate, which is a section 4A rebate. Okay. And then they've got a section 4Q deferral. And that deferral just says that anything you, you leave to your spouse, tax liability is deferred to the second dying. Okay. So in this situation, they would almost immediately have to have to contribute towards a, a SARS payment. Um, so I would always advise them to either leave their or to leave their life covers to each other and mm -hmm. uh, take make the most of those benefits. Okay. Um, and then secondly, it's almost a, a, a forbidden thing to leave a child as a beneficiary on a life cover. Tell, that, tell us why. The so the financial services industry, um, so just let me clarify that. So if they say they're happy to pay the tax, they actually want the children to benefit rather than each other. Okay. And they're accepting that they're not going to get that 4Q benefit. And they still insist that they want their children to inherit. Then you need to look at the structure behind the beneficiary nomination, because essentially the children, you mentioned the children are eight and 11. Now, I always say to clients, so if you leave things to a child, think about it logistically. That involves an EFT from a life cover company of a yeah. large sum of money to who exactly? And you can say just to the child, but that child probably doesn't even have a bank account. Yeah. Then you've also given an 11 year old a vast sum of money. That money is not going to go where it's supposed to go. It's going to be open to abuse. Suddenly they're going to have a lot of friends. They're going to have a lot of very yeah, of caring uncles and aunties who are going to become very close with that child very yeah. suddenly. And effectively, you can actually break the family unit. So the right advice of that would be to leave the funds to the estate okay and then by way of a will into a testamentary trust because that money needs to be safeguarded and looked after for for the children but it cannot go into their own hands so what the law says when you're leaving money to a minor child one of two things happens either it pays into the control of its guardians okay it should have and the control of the child's guardians mm -hmm. or it pays into a thing called the guardian's fund okay. depending on what kind of asset it is now the guardian's fund is run by the government i don't really need to get into too much detail <laughs> there yeah but i don't want my kids money going in there of course um so that's where you get um, a properly drafted will and the setup of a testamentary trust which will effectively mean that that money is controlled for the benefit of the child and there's no risk on that child from family there's no risk from friends there's no risk on that child let's say the child's 16 when the parents pass away what does a 16 year old want a gtr that's all they want yeah a a motorbike a dirt GTR. bike technology <laughs> yeah absolutely and um, that's the kind of stuff you want to avoid because people often forget that money has a has a purpose money has a job to do when someone passes away but if you put if you don't put that money into the right structure it's not going to do its job so yeah those are those are my two points i picked up there the first one is we're wasting tax benefits by going straight to children instead of going across to spouses okay and secondly um the the um the beneficiary nomination of a child should actually never be allowed um, on a on a life cover now um with what that, happens with are, uh, it, retirement benefits uh, properties uh, unit trust shares uh, can kids be beneficiaries of those so you um unit trust yes retirement yes because reti retirement is actually different from the rest of the list of uh, assets you've given there mm -hmm. so let's deal with retirement first so okay. retirement funds actually sit in a trust already yeah. so let's say you decide you're going to use Mentum. Um, for your, your retirement annuity. So there's actually a, a trust for that retirement annuity that your funds sit in. And they've got their own board of trustees. So you can put a beneficiary nomination there, um, but it won't necessarily always pay according to your beneficiary nomination. Okay. And that is a very, very scary thing for a lot of, a lot of clients. So um, just to break it down, if you look at life cover versus retirement benefits, Life cover is governed by the Long-Term Insurance Act. Okay. Retirement benefits 
retirement benefits are, are governed by the Pension Funds Act. Okay. Now, in the Pension Funds Act, there's a section 37C, which says that, I mean, colloquially, what it says is that even if you do put a beneficiary nomination, it's more of a suggestion than an instruction because the trustees have the responsibility to decide who your financial dependents are. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I take my retirement annuity, I've put my spouse on. Okay. Um, I shouldn't have started this uh, scenario with myself, but I'm going to carry on. <laughs> Let's say, for example, yeah. um, I'm going to get into trouble for this. Let's say, for example, <laughs> I put my wife on as yeah. the beneficiary. Okay. When I pass away, there's two ladies in black at my funeral. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So I've got a girlfriend on the side. Yeah. But I've been paying her a salary of 10 grand a month. Yeah. This creates an issue because she is effectively a financial dependent of mine. Your girlfriend. So she can, she, yeah, the okay. girlfriend yeah. that no one knows about. Yeah. But she can actually apply to the pension fund for a portion of my retirement benefits. Wow. Because she's entitled to it in terms of Section 37C. And that's where it often gets a little hairy um, when, when a client passes away because the wording says financial dependents are allowed to make claim to this money. So, so that really would include kids as well. Exactly. Yeah. Because the, there's a few little children running around as well and this and that. And it yeah. creates a, a, lot of, a lot of drama. And that's why when I chat to, to clients, sorry, I've got the hardy dogs going here. No problem. Um, when, I, when I chat to clients, I, I always say that, I mean, retirement benefits are great. Um, group life cover is awesome. But a short term, I mean, sorry, not short term, a, um, a life cover pays who you tell it to pay. It, yeah. it's, a, it's a blind money cannon. And that, that's the beauty of a life cover where um, you can actually know exactly where that money is going to go. So you've got a lot more surety sitting with a life cover than you do with like a group life cover or a pension fund. Okay. All right, cool. We, we spoke about um, assets going into the testamentary trust for clients, but um, with a, a lot of clients that I speak to, as soon as I mention the word trust, uh, the sort of fear comes about because most people view trust as something for, for the rich. Is, is that the so, case? No, it's not at all. Um, the thing is that a trust is, is an estate planning asset. Um, the, the easiest way to think about a trust is adding a person to your family. It's adding a person that can do anything that you or I could do. Um, and with an extra, call it, body in your family to, to grow wealth, um, you can actually main, or maintain or, or attain a lot of benefits um, from a from a estate structuring uh, perspective. From I mean, even even on a tax perspective, there, there's still a few benefits on a trust, and um, they're taken away most of the good ones. But there's still tax benefits on a trust, and um, but most importantly, that new person that you've added to your family can never die. So it just will carry on. And carry on looking after the rest of your family as the as the generation goes. And that, that's the beauty of a trust. Because when I pass away in call it fifty years time, okay. so I end up passing away. My estate is over. So I need to pay my taxes. I need to pay my capital gains. I need to I need to actually liquidate my estate. Whereas because a trust is carries on in perpetuity, there's none of that that happens. So. For example, I believe in trusts. If um, I've, I've got a, a family trust myself, when yeah. I buy a property, I mm -hmm. put it into my trust because I know that that property will never have to be transferred again. Okay. Just forever, that's going to be a benefit going on for my children um, until someone messes it up. But um, the the intention is for for just to carry on for it to carry on going. Okay, and what about what about the costs involved to set up the trust? Because we know there's different types of trusts. Before we go to costs, let's talk about the different types of trusts that are available to us as South Africans. Okay, so you've got a the main trust that people know about. Yes. Um, and yeah, so from a perspective of people knowing about trust, you've got an inter vivos trust. Okay, so an inter vivos trust is your general family trust. Um, inter vivos means between lives. It's just the trust that carries on forever. Raising financially savvy children involves teaching them a variety of skills. 
from budgeting to planning to earning and saving. Besides giving them an understanding of the value of a rand, it prepares them for real-world finances. Financial literacy is a vital skill, and it is never too early to teach your kids about money. Many parents wonder how they can teach their kids about money and where to find age-appropriate resources. You can now purchase the Financial Literacy for Kids workbook, which is aimed at primary school kids. It's now available at www.financiallyfabulousfemales.com. This workbook provides you with 12 lessons, activities, lesson plans, discussion points, and quizzes that you can use to test your kids' knowledge. Shop now at www.financiallyfabulousfemales.com. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Tuned In. Now back to the show. All right, so um, you've got your main trust, which is an interview loss trust. That's the one that most people know about, most people have, but that is the one that, that actually ends up costing a little bit more money than um, than than most other trusts. The reason being that it actually needs to be set up generally by an accountant or an attorney or um, someone who provides that service and they'll charge an upfront fee. All right. Now, capital, leg- capital legacy has come in and we've got a little bit of a different model on that. Okay. Um, so from the 1st of October, we're going to be able to do that at no cost to a customer. Um, so we can, we can set up and, and draft and sort everything out for a um, client and um, without having to charge an upfront fee because we're using the same model as the walls. Okay, so you're doing um, free trust setups for, for clients now? Yes. Perfect. We'll be doing that go, going forward from the 1st of October. The caveat is that we need... Sorry, I, I lost you there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. It's all clear. Sorry, there we go. Okay. So um, we... We've looked at trusts in South Africa, and we believe that many trusts, if not most trusts, are actually not in line with what the law lies of a trust. And the reason being that one of the requirements of a trust is an, a fully independent trustee. And a fully independent trustee needs to actually be a professional who understands the nose trusts, okay. and at this, in the same breath, is not linked to the client in any way or form. Yeah. So a lot of people want to make the accountant, the independent trustee. But the problem is that accountant provides services to the client mm-hmm. and is paid for those services. So he's not actually independent. Independent, yes. Um, applies for the family lawyer. They go, I want to get my lawyer to be a trustee on the trust, which is all good and well, except you also do legal work with him. Um, you pay him for his services and that breaks that independence level. So what's available in South Africa is you've got a lot of trust houses who are independent trustees, but they are prohibitively expensive. And I'm yeah. talking about probably a few thousand rand a month wow. um, to, to act as that independent trustee. And that, that almost makes it un- um, the reason being um, there's a lot of responsibility on an independent trustee um, where but a trustee has um, personal liability on all the assets in a trust. So if something is wrong, that trustee can actually be held liable for any losses incurred. Wow. And for that reason, people um, it did to, to be an independent trustee. So what Capital Legacy has done is we've actually said, we will manage the trust, we will draft the trust, we will set everything up, we will provide basic accounting services, we will do everything that we need to do. Hello? but she just makes it accessible clients. All right. Now, uh, the last minute or so got cut off. So in exchange for drafting the trust for, for the clients, uh, what's in it for Capital Legacy? Other uh, than being placed as an executor. So um, remember the executor is on the client. The trust is another person. Okay. So what we do there is we want to be, be the independent trustee. Yeah. Because by law, you need to actually have an in, a fully independent trustee. And like I said, that 2,000, 3,000 rand a month is just too much for, for most clients. So what we've yes. done is we've actually dropped that all the way down to 850 rand a month. 
Okay. So that a client who has a trust requirement can have a fully independent trustee. Mm -hmm. And we've included in that basic accounting, um, we've included the management of the trust, the minutes of the trust, tax advice. Um, if we need to set up um, PTY vehicles to, to carry as any of that, all of that is actually included in the monthly 850 rand. Wow. Okay. Um, and that makes it a lot more accessible to a client. Um, who has a business or who is busy growing a, an estate. Because the problem with trusts is getting money into trusts is very difficult. So it's easy to, or it's easier to grow funds in a trust. Okay. But actually getting those funds from your name into a trust is very difficult. And so you often get clients who are, let's say, 45, they've had quite a successful life, and they'll come to us and say, we want to do a trust. Yeah. It's all good and well, except that money is already in their name. Okay. And in, this, in the same way that I, um, you, you can't give me 10 million rand. Yeah. That client can't give 10 million rand to the, to the, trust. To the trust because of the nation's tax. Yeah. Um, and and that's, where, that's where it gets a little tricky. So we're trying to find a way to encourage clients that will need trusts to do it earlier. Um, so that when they are 28 years old and doing quite well, they will start saying, I want to actually start my trust now. So that by the time they turn 45, the funds are in the trust already. We don't need to uh, try and so, uh, get so those funds. So when is the best time to, to start a trust? When, when you start working, when you acquire a house, when you start a family? What are those events that should trigger you to, okay, to alert you, say, you know what, I need a trust now? <laughs> That's a very, very difficult question. Um, the thing is, your financial advisor should actually um, be able to judge that and, mm -hmm. and have a look at, at, the, at the way that that, that estate is growing, have a, have a look at, at the client's needs and actually make a judgment on what those needs will be in the future. Like I said, it's a very difficult thing. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's for the clients that, that want to, to box smart one day. So it's for the clients that would like to grow a substantial estate, but okay. don't want to do it in their own hands. They want yeah. to do it in the hands of a trust so that they can use that to, to look after. But again, it's a, it, it, it's a difficult thing because when you're young, you don't think about that. Yeah. When you're old, it's too expensive. It's too late. <laughs> so you yeah. kind of got to find the guys, you got to find the guys with, who, who have the dream, yeah. um, the, the guys who want to, want to actually get it all, all done properly. But that being said, you can always do something with the trust. So I don't want, to, I don't want people who are um, in, in the, or middle-aged to turn around and say, well, no, now I can't do a trust. You can always do a trust. Remember, you can always grow and, and, and benefit from that. Um, but the, the biggest benefits are if you're a bit younger. Yeah. Um, but once you, um, once you have an estate, then I'd say come speak to us because we can give the honest advice on that and say, well, we can do this, that, this, and um, the client can then make the call on what he wants to do. All right, perfect. Uh, let's talk about, I know we went straight into trust. Let's talk a bit about uh, what happens if there's no will in place when, when a spouse dies. In the case of Josh yeah. and Jane, what would happen if there wasn't a will in so, place if one so spouse had to die? That, that is a, it's a big problem. Yeah. Um, the passing away, there's two ways to die in South Africa. The first way is testate. Okay. Um, and that is when you've got a will in place. And the second way is intestate, when you don't actually have a will. And your will is an extremely important document because it's your rule book. It's the rule book of in what your voice when you, when you cannot speak anymore. Um, and I mean, just putting it that way um, actually gives it the gravity it needs to have. When you pass away, your estate needs to be wound up, whether you have a will or not. But the rule book makes it a lot easier. Um, I always joke around and I say, passing away without a will is kind of like playing rugby with no rules. Okay. Um, yeah. If you want to play rugby with no rules, it sounds a little bit fun, but it, someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. But it's the same with the will. Making sure that you've got the black and white in place and a properly nominated executor means that things go a lot quicker, smoother, and effectively a lot cheaper because we can make sure that you've got things going in the right direction. So drafting a will is a big problem in South Africa. 
Currently, 20% of South Africans have their wills um, in place. And that means that 80% just don't. And the problem is that when those 80% pass away, it creates those problems, those nightmare stories that you hear about. Yeah. And it's actually such an easy thing to do. Um, I mean, you, you're aware that capital legacy drafts will at no cost. We yes. can send a consultant out and get the will put in place. Quick, it's easy, and um, it, it should be done by every responsible person in this country. Yeah. Um, so when you pass away, you have to firstly nominate an executor. An executor is the person who steps into your shoes and manages and closes down your affairs. Okay. Um, and that is a very important job. So the, the misconception in the, um, out in, in the market is that anyone can be an executor. But the, the rules are quite clear when it comes to that. If your estate is less than 250,000 rand, then anyone can do the work. Okay. But if your estate is worth more than 250,000 rand, then you need a legally appointed executor. And it's actually insisted upon by the master, okay. which creates a problem when you've nominated your uncle or your brother or your spouse, because they will be met with resistance when they try and do the work. And they will actually be instructed to go and get a lawyer. Okay. And that creates a problem because those lawyers will then come in and That's charge right. maximum fees. Yeah. Um, so that's why we say rather choose a company that you have heard about, read up about, and trust that will do the work quickly and efficiently. Um, in my personal situation, I will refuse to make my spouse my executor because I can just imagine what's going to happen if I do pass away. The yeah. last thing she wants to do is deal with my estate yeah. um, and go through my ID document and try and close the bank accounts. She can't do that. And mm. it wouldn't be fair on me to expect that of her. So I've got a legally appointed executor that I know will step into my shoes. I trust them mm -hmm. and they will do all the work. It's all to with our, our professionally and quickly. Um, speed is, is um, very underrated when it comes to an estate because um, people say oh, it doesn't really matter how long it takes. It really does because you want that to be over so that people can carry on with their lives. Yeah. Um, the average in this country to wind up an estate is just over two years. Wow. which is a long time yeah, and nothing should take that long. So um, with the way we've structured it, our average is between six and nine months. Um, so I'd probably say, you could safely say about eight months on okay. real estate. And that's been done. The client can then carry on or the, um, the client's family can then carry on with their lives. Yeah. I mean, that's a very important thing. But just getting back to, or answering the question, but getting back to um, the trust side of it, that, there's also a very big problem there. If you just pass away, um, I, I say to husbands and wives when I, when I sit with them to draft their wills, I say, if you pass away, um, so it's not the end of the world. There's some life cover, there's, everything will be fine, everything will go across to your spouse, we're all good, she'll be fine. Okay. The same applies if she passes away. If yeah. she leaves everything to him, the life cover, everything's cool, it goes across. The problem comes in when both pass away because what happens to the money? And that's um, like I mentioned earlier, depending on the kind of asset, you're looking at dealing with guardians of the children, which could be previous partners. Okay. Um, or could just be family members that you thought you trusted, but money changes people. Yeah, it does. Or the alter alternative being the government. And Again, I uh, hope that one day we can say that with pride, but currently, yeah. the government's not great at looking after that. Um, so we need to make sure that in your will there's a testamentary trust. Now, that's the other type of trust. It's, it's not the same as the intervivos that we discussed earlier. Uh -huh. A testamentary trust is actually an awesome thing because it doesn't cost any money. Yeah. It doesn't actually exist until required. So... For me, I've got a testamentary trust um, for my children if me and my spouse were to pass away. I don't pay anything for it. It just lies dormant in my world. If I were to pass away, that trust would create itself and catch the funds to look after the children. Yeah. Um, and then going forward, that can actually make sure that the kids are okay, but it will avoid the government getting involved and it will avoid guardians getting involved with that money. 
so, and so, much safer we'll live. So I know with uh, Capital Legacy, you guys are executors in in the independent executors in the testamentary trust. Um, what yeah. are the benefits for parents, like knowing that if something were to happen, uh, their kids will be taken care of? So how is that trust, the testamentary trust, how is that administered from you from your side? So that, it, it is what we do. Um, I mean, we we are trustees on trusts. Um, we um, have many trusts that we are currently looking after. Um, we also want, have owned up over a thousand estates um, in the last few years. The, so we know what we're doing when it comes to that. But our model is different because we look to charge the least or no amount based on the planning. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm sure you, you're aware of how we work. Yes. Um, how it works is we actually do a calculation up front with the client. Because the last thing you want is a bill for your family. So what we do is when we sit with the client, we actually calculate everything for them and show them in rands on their estate what the costs will be so that they can make a decision on how to deal with it. And then we've got ins- optional insurance products which clients can take. And uh, I mean, our average premium is in the region of about 150 rand a month yeah. where they can know that all their costs are covered so that when they do pass away to, to wind up the estates, to transfer any properties if required, um, to set up trusts for the children and to administer those trusts going forward. All those costs can be covered so that we don't have to um, sit in a situation where an invoice is delivered effectively to a child. And that's something which um, blows my mind. I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and I get very cross when I, when I think about what's going out in the market with yeah. the invoices that are going out because people do charge a lot of money to do this work. Okay. All right, cool. What um, what is the process, the winding up process, and the taxes that are due when a person dies in South Africa? So when a client does pass away, like I said, you've got to take their book of life and close it. So you've got to tie up all the loose ends. And the first thing that one does is obviously one doesn't rush into it because the family needs a bit of time. Uh, but as soon as they're ready then go out and sit with the family and actually go through the estate and see what needs to be done and take information in. We've also got computer systems where we can check if the client has any shares or properties or cars or we can actually find out what exactly needs to be done. Okay. We make a big list of that and then we start the work. And how that works is basically an estate late bank account or actually, sorry, rather we need to get a letter of executorship issued by the master of the high court. Okay. Now, with a properly drafted will, um, the clients generally will nominate us as the executors. We can then go to the master and get our letter of executorship. And that's the first step on an estate. After that, we need to open an estate late bank account. Now, that bank account gets opened. It's a, it's a trust account. It's, it's properly audited and, and there's, um, everyone has sight of that, that account uh, to, to make sure that everything stays safe. But then we use that as the bank account to finalize everything. So any income that would come in from a rental property or anything like that goes into the bank account. Okay. Uh, any expense that needs to be paid will then come out of the bank account. And we actually keep a nice account of that and um, disclose that to the family as we go. We then need to do all the nitty gritties like, um, I mean, we don't think about TV licenses. How hard it is to get rid of a TV license. <laughs> so we would need to transfer the TV license. We would need to sort out the cell phone accounts and um, the medical aid. Generally, the medical aid, people always forget to, uh, to stop the medical aid when, uh, when a client passes away. So they'll generally charge an extra premium or two okay. um, on the medical aid after the client passed away. We will go get that money back. And okay. we will say, you actually insured a guy who wasn't around anymore. You need to pay us back. So we'll get that money back in again. Um, we need to pay the insurances on the property or on the car or any of the things that still need to actually carry on. Mm-hmm. Um, the bank account needs to be closed and that money needs to go into the state aid bank account. Um, properties need to be transferred according to what the will says. Yeah. So um, again, this is, this is where it gets difficult. When you pass away without a will, there's the formula of how people inherit. And it's generally a split through everyone in different percentages. So um, in your example, the wife would get X amount, the kids would get X amount, but let's say, for example, that property, 
how, how do you transfer percentages of a property? It gets property. very messy. Yeah. So, but in a properly drafted will, you can say, no, I want my property to go to my wife. Yeah. We can then transfer that whole property to the spouse. Okay. And we will have to do that through the deeds office, obviously. Mm -hmm. And transfer the card and get everything sorted out. And then what, what we do is we have to do what's called a liquidation and distribution account. Okay. Now, a liquidation and distribution mm -hmm. account is a picture of your entire estate and basically life in rands and things. All right. So all money that's coming in, all money that's gone out, all assets, it's like a balance sheet. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be submitted to the master for approval. And we actually let it lie open. And there's, there's time periods where you actually need to let it lie open for a certain amount of days okay. um, for public inspection. Okay. Um, we need to advertise for creditors. So if the client owes anyone money, we actually need to advertise in the paper. Mm -hmm. to say, does our client owe anyone anything? And then again, we also need to advertise and say, does anyone owe our client anything? Obviously, for the, the creditors, they're a bit quicker than the debtors. Yeah. But um, after that's all approved and our liquidation and distribution account is approved, we can start with the distributions on the estate. And at that point, we will then pay out the money um, to the family or to the cemetery trust or however we would need to um, need to do all of that and then after that we close the file okay all right cool we're out of time for today nick thank you so much any any last words you have for our listeners out there um well from my experience with with uh, doing what i do the from someone who knows how how it works the the first thing especially as a parent that you need to do is get a world drafted um, I mean, I'm, I'm horrified by the, by the times that I go to a, um, a braai or a social gathering and people ask what I do. And I say, well, and they say, oh, I've never done that. But I can see their children running around. Yeah. And you almost want to ask people, but don't you care about what's going to happen? And, and the defense is that I don't know. But I didn't know that it's actually so hectic if I pass away without a war. Yeah. Um, and that's why I just like to tell as many people as possible consequences are dire if um, if we do pass away without a wall um, so the first thing to do is just get the document in place it doesn't cost a cent to do using the right service providers um, i mean now heaven forbid i say this use any service provider just get the papers signed but um, if you do do it with capital legacy we don't charge for the drafting of the wall. Of so Get that done. That is the, the absolute most important thing I can tell anyone. All right. Thank you so much, Nick, for your time. Hopefully we can have you back on right. to answer a lot more questions we have for you. There we go. All right. Uh, you have a lovely day. Okay, you as well. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So that's my chat with Nick Steed. If you want to know more about this, if you want to get uh, a specialist in front of you, either on the phone or come out and see you, uh, let me arrange that for you. Go to www.financiallyfabulousfemales.com forward slash estate plan. I'm going to arrange for somebody to come out and um, provide you with all the information that you need to get your financial planning and estate planning in order as well. All right, so I'll chat to you next week on the Wealth Nation podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to visit our website at www.financiallyfabulousfemales.com and sign up for our free investment masterclass.